Celebrating entrepreneurs and creativity. Talking business, pleasure, real life, get together. Join us here. Hello and welcome back to the Creative Entrepreneurs Podcast. You guys know what this podcast is all about. It's where we turn creativity into careers and also passion into profit. How do we do that? By providing amazing content and value so you can build business structures around your talent or your creativity so you can start monetizing your talent. And I just want to shout out really, really quickly, as usual, our amazing sponsors, Route 36, Always do a fantastic job with the production. Always do a great job making me look and sound amazing. You can find Route 36 just um, through my social media and through the show notes. Just click on their website and have a look again. They also offer 36% off podcast support um, off of some of their packages. Um, Obviously, terms and conditions apply. But if you are looking to launch or um, produce your own podcast and you're not quite sure how to do it then these guys can support you and whether it's the studio whether it's equipment whether it's the editing um, they can support you and if you listen to this podcast or if you're this a podcast listener all you need to do is quote c e route 36 um i believe um, I'll double check that um, and um, you'll get 36% off your production needs. But back to the show, um, I am super, super, super gassed to <laughs> <laughs> have this next guest. I tried before and failed, um, but now we, we've, we've made it happen. Um, Cam Davis, who is just absolutely incredible, a, an amazing, awesome entrepreneur, founder of Nyla um, and just in my eyes a entrepreneur to watch welcome to the podcast (laughs) I'm gassed with that introduction (laughs) so how are you how was your journey and stuff thank you yeah Yeah, journey here was eventful Mm -hmm. um, but I got here eventually it's a bit of a way away isn't it yeah Yeah, but it's it's nice it's quaint yeah I like it yeah and and I think it's you know it's it's different and um, it just, you know, it just adds to the, you know, sequoia. Of yourself, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's nice. <laughs> Good. Um, so for, you know, I, I obviously know you can, we, we yeah. met a few years ago now yeah. um, at a entrepreneurial hub, NatWest. Well, we were reintroduced. Oh yeah, we were reintroduced, reintroduced as, NatWest. yeah, because yeah, before, yeah, we, was, we knew each other, but not as entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, but we were reintroduced as entrepreneurs um, at NatWest Entrepreneur Hub, which I'm sure we'll discuss a little bit. But for those of the listeners who do not know you, just give a brief insight as to who you are. Yeah. Um, So my name is Cam, or Camise Davis. I go by Cam. I am the founder of Nyla's Naturals, which is a high-performance textured hair care company, recently featured on Dragon's Den. We are after world domination, so watch this space. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm a mother of two, so I juggle, obviously, entrepreneurship and business management with my home life, which is my priority, raising my two children um, and being a mother, and that pretty much sums sums me up in that capacity anyway Mm -hmm. okay so we touched upon nyla cosmetics and was that your first business or my first business venture ever yeah so so what made you create uh, uh, yeah well um it i was inspired really by my daughter which is why i named the brand after her so Mm -hmm. my daughter now 10 her name is nyla and when she was born shortly i think Shortly after, a few months, I started to notice that she developed really dry skin that was extremely sensitive. So she would react to so many things that she came in contact with. So I really had to start being very selective with, you know, the detergents I was using, the creams I was using, the body washes I was using, and try to find something that was as natural as possible Mm. that wouldn't aggravate her skin. Um, In doing so, I became really ingredient conscious 
And I think that's a really important term because so often we're picking up things off the shelves and products and we don't know exactly what's going into those products. Mm. So I started to develop an understanding of what these long words on the back of a label meant and where they were derived from. And in doing so, I became really horrified actually with a lot of the raw materials that were used in the products that I would just pick up off the shelf and use. Mm-hmm. Um, So I started to look for more natural alternatives. And what I struggled to find was something for her hair. It's like skin is skin, isn't Mm. it? Like a a cream you can use on a Caucasian person, you can use on a black person, it's cream. Mm. But with hair products, because our hair is so uniquely structured, Mm -hmm. we need to have a product that's uniquely designed for our hair type. So then I became really... Um, conscious about the black hair care market Mm -hmm. and the products that were available to black women. And in doing my research, I realized that a lot of the products were really toxic. Mm. So they contained carcinogenics, endocrine disruption, it disruptors, the things that would literally mess with your overall health and well-being. Um, So not wanting to Mm -hmm. put that on her and not being able to find an alternative, I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to be the Mm. solution here. And I literally started mixing, Mm. (laughs) mixing creams and potions and lotions in the kitchen. And then I realized that in terms of the performance and the efficacy that I wanted, it was something that I couldn't do at home. Mm -hmm. I needed to have a scientist. I needed somebody with those expertise to be able to develop the type of formulations that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I went on the journey of finding a cosmetic scientist. And that was really hard Mm. um, because... Many of the scientists that I approached at the time, we they were used to black women wanting to chemically straighten their hair. Mm. So a lot of the formulations were designed to alter the curl pattern. But what I wanted was something that would showcase the beauty of Afro hair, but also really restricted a lot of the raw materials that they were used to working with. So in a way, I kind of stretched them out of their comfort zone as well. Um, and after several years of development, because it took a long time, wow. it took a few years oh, um, and a few scientists <laughs> and a few <laughs> tears, um, we finally came up with a formulation that I felt was superior to anything else I had sampled on the market. Wow. And and then we went to launch with no money whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, Camp, like, there's so much that you said in there that we, we, we need to unpack. Yeah. Um, but the first thing that I want to just have a, a, a brief look at is the very f- the very reason why you created this yeah you know this product and and as entrepreneurs it usually is a need that hasn't been met for us or somebody yeah. that we love um, and care about and we think well if it's not being catered for then there's an opportunity there because if I need it Absolutely. then the, the chances are somebody else will need it yeah. so you. So you realised that there was a product that you needed because of your, your daughter, but then also you did your research about the industry um, of mm. the black hair market. Yeah. And immediately, it's just like the product that's needed, <laughs> this, this market is, is lucrative. Yeah. Let's, and, and that is a true, true entrepreneur. Yeah. Honestly. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I never anticipated that I would Mm. be an entrepreneur. Wow, really? 10 years back. Yeah, because I was kind of in the corporate sector. So Mm. my focus was on um, obviously elevating Mm -hmm. in the very corporate world and, you know, breaking through the gas glass scene and in that capacity. Um, But in realizing how harmful the black hair care market was to the people he was targeting and as a black woman myself that was something that really concerned me mm. you know why are these massive multi-million multi-billion pound companies using raw materials that have been linked to cancer why are they using raw materials that are known to cause disruptions in people's hormones and when you take into consideration again that black women have a high um, prevalence of experiencing fibroids Mm. and cancer is rising in the black community and then you see that there's a direct link to some of the raw materials that have been used in the products that we are typically accessing you have to question what is what is going Mm. on here you know Mm -hmm. Um, um, and ultimately, I 
I'm really passionate about ensuring that my daughter and other young women grow up feeling a sense of pride in their authenticity. Mm -hmm. So that was another one of my key drivers. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create a product that said, you know what? You don't have to mm -hmm. straighten your hair mm -hmm. to be beautiful. Your hair is amazing just the way it is. So for me, it was creating a platform and a brand and a language that communicated that to Love young that. women, but also older women who have mm -hmm. never heard that message before. So... It kind of just grew from there. Mm. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I absolutely love that. Um, and I love I love the key messaging, particularly yeah. for, you know, black girls and, yeah. and black women who has always been told and, and shown that, you know, it's straight hair that's beautiful. Yeah. And um, so for you yeah. to be like, actually, actually. we want to celebrate our kinks and, our, yeah. and all of our natural hair in its, in its rawness. And I think that's, that's beautiful and amazing. Thank you. But it's also for me, one of my, the key things that I like to get across is it's important that we also celebrate the versatility of our hair. So I'm not saying don't wear straight hair. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is understand that your hair in its natural state is beautiful straight, it's beautiful curly, mm. it's, it's just beautiful, but mm -hmm. you don't have to subscribe to this notion that in order to be beautiful, mm -hmm. I have to conform to these Western standards mm -hmm. of beauty. So that's really important to me. Wow, wow, yeah. I absolutely love that. So just in terms of your, your journey, I know that you mentioned that you was in the corporate world. Yeah. At what point were you like, right, I'm leaving the job and now I'm all in in this business? Like, was it a, a light bulb? Was it like a, 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 a defining moment? Um, I think I could romanticise it and say that, <laughs> but no, I was made redundant. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was made redundant okay. and during that period I was like you know what I'm gonna go for this guns blazing mm. I'm gonna put everything into this and see what comes of it mm. as one of again something that really propels me forward is I never want to be in a position where I'm what ifing mm. you know what if I had put mm. my all into this or what if I had just bitten mm. the bullet and jumped straight in I would rather give it my all mm -hmm. and it not transpire into what I want, mm -hmm. but have no regrets yeah. and have all of those amazing lessons because I don't believe in failure. Mm -hmm. I just believe that every hurdle is an opportunity to learn mm -hmm. how to get better the next time mm -hmm. and overcome that hurdle mm -hmm. and be more skilled and competent for mm -hmm. the next go around. Love right. It. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> Love it. Always fail forward. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that, that's yeah. a motto that They're I... Just lessons. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely love it. And, okay. So as a woman in, mm. in business and as a black woman in business, I'm sure yeah. that you would have been told a few times i'm sure that you would have had the doors closed on you a few times so like be a nose <laughs> i listen <laughs> i can't count the nose <laughs> um yeah there was just the, approaching my first scientist no you can't do that you know approaching my first brand consultant no you don't have enough money approaching my first designer no i'm sorry but we can't support you because your budget isn't big enough the, from the moment i decided that i was going to put something on the market i was told no um the first time i approached a retailer um i was told yes but what they how they wanted the brand wasn't in line with what i thought the brand's potential was so mm -hmm. Even though I said no to their offering, it wasn't their offering still wasn't what I wanted, if that makes mm. sense. So um, I think as a, a woman of colour, it's really difficult because, you know, there are so many statistics that show that women in entrepreneurship find it a lot more difficult to navigate the space because there's a lot of other things that they need to contend with. Mm -hmm. There's chauvinism, there's a the um, you know, penetrating a male dominated environment. Mm -hmm. But then in addition to that, they also have to navigate their families. If mm. they have families, um, they have to navigate being a mom. And they, these are the type of pressures that are not necessarily um, pressures that are experienced by men in the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as a black woman, there's also statistics that show that, you know, people of color get less 
financial support when mm -hmm. they're launching their businesses or their access to funding and mm -hmm. finance is extremely limited. So these were hurdles that I'd experienced. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've pitched. Mm. Dragon's Den wasn't my first pitch, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But yeah, I, I just want to come on to that because, um, you know, you were, you were told no many times, yeah. but there was one occasion there was one, yes. that you was told. And I just need the yes. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was on Dragon's Den. I think it was this yeah. season. Yes, yeah, it was. This season. Yeah. Um, and um, you was told yes by Sarah, Sarah Davis. Yeah, she Sarah. is amazing. Um, so yeah. uh, uh, I just want, like, when I was younger, I used to watch Dragon's Den. Mm -hmm. And I used to think one day I'm going to pitch on Dragon's Den. <laughs> um, but then I always used to get scared and be like, no, I'm not doing it. So yeah. just to deep that you went on to Dragon's Den, yeah. that you silenced all your fears and, and everybody watching and you went on and you were so confident with your product and Thank your you. pitch was flawless. And I was there going, oh, <laughs> somebody <laughs> said yes. Uh, but that for me in itself is just inspirational because I, I, I think coming from where we come from mm. and you know from the inner city and and yeah. being black we we often think that those things are are not in our league or, or yeah. level and, and and it is a limiting belief yeah um and Absolutely. all it does is t it takes one to do it to make others realize that actually cam's mm. done it so so can i mm. um so i will be going on at some point good <laughs> um good, good. but I, I just want to talk about that experience. So yeah. I want to really speak about when did you decide and how did it, the opportunity come about and what reservations did you have, honestly? Okay. Um, so like you, I am an avid fan of Dragon's Den. So I'm, you know, the person who will be giving it big while I'm sitting <laughs> on my couch. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Saying, why don't you know your figures? And why <laughs> um <laughs> And I think it was season 17. Um, I just finished watching it. And then, you know, they come up with the advert, if you are interested in applying and you're an entrepreneur, submit your application. And I just finished reading a book by Shonda Rhimes called mm -hmm. The Year of Yes, where she talks about the importance of putting yourself forward for opportunities, mm -hmm. especially as women and of women of color, because oftentimes we don't put ourselves mm -hmm. forward. And um, I was like, you know what? Okay. <laughs> okay it was simple as that yeah. it was like okay i was talking to the guy on the tv i was like all right mr man i'll, I'll, I'll get it done um and i submitted my application online before you submitted did you speak to anybody about it or I, did you just I spoke to my partner mm -hmm. and i am very fortunate to have a amazing fiance who he just seems to see the best in mm. me all of the time. And boop, he's, boop. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Honestly, he's, he's always like pumping me up and gassing me up. And, you know, he really believes in me more than sometimes I believe in myself. Mm. But I think you need that. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know what, babes, do it. You'll be incredible. You'll be amazing. So I um, submitted my application and didn't think mm -hmm. anything of it because they get thousands mm. of applications annually you mm -hmm. know and throughout the year as well and I think several months later I had my initial phone call and then went through the whole shortlisting process mm -hmm. of that um, and then eventually in October so I was shortlisted I believe in March mm -hmm. and um, but they don't say whether or not you're definitely going to go on the den mm -hmm. they only give you a couple of weeks mm -hmm. so in September there was like okay yeah we're going to select you to go forward in the den um, wow. And again, it was it was very surreal because I don't think I ever actually really deeped it until mm. the night of the show. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is really going on national TV. Mm -hmm. um, but when I walked into the den, that was such a surreal experience. Really? It was such a surreal. Did you experience. see the the dragons before? You don't see them before. No. Oh wow. No, you don't have any contact with any of them at all wow. before, and they know nothing about you. They know nothing about your product. Really? Nothing. Yeah. So you set your table up. The producers wheel it into the room. Then they put a screen over your table. 
Then when you go in the lift, they remove the screen and the dragons have about 30 seconds, I think, to observe the product before you walk through the door. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very new. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, yeah, I remember the lift doors opening up and there are these incredible entrepreneurs that I've been watching for over a decade mm-hmm. in some respects, you know. And it was nerve wracking. Mm. It really was. But I just knew, well, you're not just pitching to them now, you're pitching <laughs> to, to the, the whole nation. <laughs> so you gotta get it together. <laughs> um yeah, and, and that was it. And I kinda of just was like, Okay, let's do it. Show mm. time. And yeah. I know that you got quite emotional um, I did. during I did the pitch. Was it because of you realise that actually as an entrepreneur you've come this far and you just needed that that one yes or was it why was you why was I so emotional I think because when you had experienced people telling you no mm. and the no's that I'd experienced were always positive no's mm. so it was always like Cam this is an amazing product you've got a really good brand and we can definitely see the market but your numbers, your numbers, your numbers. Mm. And I always knew that my turnover didn't reflect the capacity of the brand mm-hmm. and the size of the market. So when they started to say no, for me, it was it was just reflective of all of the other mm-hmm. experience that I had where there was like, you're fantastic, you're great, mm. you're amazing, but your numbers, and I'm like, well, how do I get to showcase the brand's capacity without having the finances and Mm -hmm. working capital that I need to market Mm -hmm. this thing this is a product based company and you have to do the marketing Mm -hmm. in order for you to drive awareness Mm -hmm. so people will shop with you Um, so it was frustration Mm. um, and I just felt I remember just feeling a little bit defeated Mm -hmm. at the time as well so Mm -hmm. that I think those emotions started to flood through because I was holding them back Mm. I was like you were not crying Mm. on national tv Mm. and then when Sarah started to say yes Mm. it was relief Mm. so the tears literally just flooded through because it was like finally yeah finally because you're carrying that that, that burden for so many years with with your business because all you need is someone to see in you and in the brand yeah that you see yeah Um, absolutely so when somebody does see that and puts as it were their money where their mouth is um it is it's 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 kind of like a, a vindication like what I have been doing all these years and working all these long nights is and it was like been validated Mm. because I knew Mm. once I get just enough working capital Mm -hmm. I knew it was going to explode so it was also like finally Mm. I'm gonna do it so we're going to talk about your you know life post um the den because I know it's all been fast and great and 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 so forth but just for those listeners out there who are thinking about investment mm. and who are thinking about getting investment ready and wanting to maybe pitch yeah. um, to investors and angel investors, what are the things that they should be thinking of um, just to get investment ready? Uh, well, what's um, your key top three things? Investment readiness is definitely have your pitch deck Mm -hmm. ready Mm -hmm. just explain what a pitch deck is so your pitch deck is a a synopsis of your brand that you will present to a investor which includes obviously your branding but it also gives them a brief insight into the size of the market it shows the research that you've done to substantiate your market it gives them information about you as a founder um, the size of the opportunity your unique selling points who you're competitors are um, and why you will be able to penetrate the market Um, so it takes a lot of research in order to get that document or that that um, yeah the document really sync synced Mm -hmm. um, but in it's able to give a lot of information in a very concise way Mm -hmm. Um, and you need your business plan because Mm -hmm. once you get past the pitch deck stage you need to be able to demonstrate all of that information in a more thorough way which is your business plan so definitely have that ready Um, and practice your pitch 
mm-hmm. is really, really important, you know, so that your delivery is flawless. You know your numbers, mm-hmm. which again is, is extremely important when you're talking mm-hmm. to investors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So pitch deck. Pitch deck. Business, business plan, plan and pitch. Pitch. Love that. Yeah. How much how many times did you practice your pitch before you, you went in? Do you know? No. <laughs> but you know that By you... now me and the mirror became homies. <laughs> 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 I mean, my reflection was, yeah, we spent a lot of time together before I went in the den. Um, but yeah, I practiced a lot. Mm. I did. Mm. Yeah. And I want to speak a little bit about access to finance. Yeah. Um, because I know that finance and having access to finance is really one crucial. of the fundamental reasons why many businesses don't pass the yeah. first year um, because of you need finances. You and there is a lot of discrimination when it comes to yeah. finances and, and accessing finance, yeah. particularly if you are black and particularly if you are a black woman. Yeah. Um, I just want to kind of get your thoughts around how did you, I guess, navigate around around those difficulties and um, was it because of that? Because I know a large part of that is venture, venture yeah. capital finance. Was because of that, did you go for angel investment like I kind of want to get your um I had approached a few venture capitalists okay. um but again I was always told that whilst the business um on paper looks phenomenal and as do I the my turnover didn't reflect that so they always told me that I wasn't ready which is something that Tuka said as well as like mm-hmm. you're not ready because you're not turning over a hundred thousand yet um so I started to look for angel investors. I went on the um, angel investors, you know, website, mm-hmm. uploaded my pitch, done a video presentation, all of that stuff. I used to, I was part of the um, Pitch Fest mm-hmm. UK. I got amazing feedback. I got callbacks from investors, but nothing materialized because that within itself takes a long time. Mm. And that it requires a lot of commitment mm-hmm. um, to get through the process. And I knew that there were going to be challenges that I would have to overcome. And it was disheartening when, especially you're part of a hub and then you meet an entrepreneur who um, perhaps, you know, just started their business really young, mm. no evidence behind mm-hmm. the performance of the mm-hmm. brand, but they managed to secure an investment for 300,000 because mm. they fit the mold. But when you look through their business deck, when you, you, you know, sorry, their business plan, mm-hmm. when you look at their pitch deck, y- there's been times where I'm like, well, I can't, I can't see how you secured three hundred thousand pounds mm. so quickly based on what you're demonstrating mm-hmm. here, and sometimes the only difference can be that I'm I'm female and mm-hmm. I'm a woman of color, mm-hmm. right? And I, I don't like to I don't like to embrace um, excuses, mm-hmm. but I think sometimes things are very apparent, mm-hmm. and there are a lot of um, reports and evidence that will substantiate what mm-hmm. my experience were because other people are experiencing the same. Mm-hmm. Um, so, was that one of the reasons why I went on Dragon's Den? No, I think when I went on Dragon's Den, it was literally me just trying to find mm-hmm. the finances mm-hmm. from anywhere mm-hmm. that I needed Do you think to grow the was, business. Was Dragon's Den the last? No. No, it yeah. wasn't the last because if mm-hmm. that didn't, then you would have found materialize. Yeah. I would have done something else. Mm-hmm. Like I was committed to finding mm-hmm. the money from somewhere, mm-hmm. and it's funny because after Dragon's Den, a lot of the investors that had previously oh, yeah. <laughs> approached oh, yeah. started to get a few mm-hmm. emails like, "Oh, let's go for coffee. Mm-hmm. Let's have lunch. Mm-hmm. You know, you did amazing. Mm-hmm. Let's revisit this. Mm-hmm. You know, this mm-hmm. investment opportunity if you like." And and it's something that. I don't need right now, mm. but it's really important to maintain those relationships in the future, just in case I do need to mm-hmm. access more finances. Mm-hmm. So let's so let's di- discuss the actual um, investment and, and partnership with, with Sarah Davis. Yes. So um, there is an N- NDA, so I can't say oh, okay. <laughs> too much, but I'll okay. say I can. <laughs> okay. Um, so t- we're just going to say what we see on okay. the TV. <laughs> um, so what was the amount of investment? So it was 50000 mm-hmm. for 40% to mm-hmm. drop down to 30% mm-hmm. once I paid back her initial investment. Okay, excellent. And 
when the I guess um, that is all agreed. Then yeah. what what happens, Paul? So do, do they have to ratify your? Oh God, due diligence before, takes yeah. a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're just nearing the end of the due diligence process wow. now, actually, um, because there is the opportunity. What people don't see is there is the opportunity to reapproach those conversations with the investor wow. um, and look at negotiating something that's more. Um, favorable for everybody involved, Mm -hmm. right? So a lot of um, the feedback that I had from the community was why did you give 40% of your business away? Firstly, one of the things that I say to that is it's better to have 50% of a thousand pounds than 100% of a pound, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's always better to Mm -hmm. um, be in the Mm -hmm. running. And secondly, I also knew that there would be more opportunities to mm-hmm. renegotiate after the cameras and mm-hmm. the lights are off um, and you can have those one-to-one conversations which is mm-hmm. what happened mm-hmm. so um, I can't tell you the details mm-hmm. but we renegotiated those mm-hmm. terms oh yeah. good <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, amazing so and the relationship now with Sarah just uh, as a as a investor mm. do they get involved in the day to day or do you are you completely I am completely autonomous and responsible for the growth and the success of the brand wow what they do offer however is is some guidance and support um somebody to give kind of like that mentorship which mm-hmm. is something i never had mm-hmm. before just being able to run your ideas past somebody and see what their thoughts mm-hmm. are um and there's access to a phenomenal team mm-hmm. right so i've got access to people who are high level marketers mm. um high level um, brand consultants mm-hmm. high level digital marketing experts mm-hmm. and these um individuals are really passionate about the brand mm. and get involved in helping to drive the brand forward so that's mm-hmm. really amazing mm-hmm. yeah so what kind of success have you seen for the brand since going on dragon's day <laughs> <laughs> i have some amazing contracts wow. that are coming up wow. with s- some of the uk's biggest retailers Boop, boop, boop. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love it. Which I'm really excited about. Mm. Um, online, I mean, we the night that the show aired, mm. I remember the phone just going off like every five seconds with an order. Wow. And I remember looking at my stock, looking at the computer, and I was like, yeah, this is not going to last. <laughs> And two days in, we were completely sold out. The website crashed a few times because it couldn't handle the traffic. And this is taken into consideration. We prepared for this, right? Mm. We were like, okay, let's make sure the website's solid, Mm -hmm. make sure it can handle the traffic. Let's make sure we get our orders in and we've got the stock in. And even so, it just massively exceeded our expectations. Sarah was like, I've never seen anything. And 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 just a side note, this just validates your point about the, the marketing. marketing right? if you exactly. If you haven't got that exposure in the marketing how and the bright product, then you? how are people going to, exactly. to buy? But yeah, sorry, carry on. Um, so we, you know, out of stock, we're still turning over an excess of five figures, even though we've been out of stock for a while. Wow. That's because of COVID, um, just getting the stock in. The reviews have been amazing and phenomenal. It's just... Overnight, it's a completely wow. different business. Wow. Um, and it's it's forced me, it's forced me to level up, mm. you know. And um, every day I have to become better. Every day I've got a new challenge. And it's it's been incredible. And it's sometimes it's surreal mm. to, um, to realize mm-hmm. that I got, to this point Mm -hmm. with the brand Mm -hmm. and it is going to do those numbers that Mm -hmm. I said it would do and that's I mean I knew it but Mm -hmm. experiencing it Mm -hmm. is incredible and you know I'm smiling for you (laughs) because you're you're saying it and I'm just like yeah I actually believe it I actually believe you know that it is going to do 
what you set out for it to do and and it's just it's it's I a mean, beautiful moment and it's a it beautiful is. moment to to just watch your journey and just you. watch how you you disrupt this market because it, it, you know it is a market disruptor you are yeah. challenging what you know black particularly black women thought was beautiful in their hair absolutely and you are showing them actually this is beautiful in a you know in the most natural way it's showcasing that there is beauty and diversity mm. and that every single person um should embrace their uniqueness mm -hmm. and as people of african descent we have historically had a lot of negative um projections towards our african features which includes our skin and our hair mm -hmm. um and I am so honoured to be able to contribute to a more positive conversation. Mm. And I am so honoured to be able to develop not only a brand, but a product and a story mm -hmm. that enables women and girls and everybody to just see their true authentic beauty and to embrace that. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, like people say, why is success to you? And like, yeah, getting an email saying, you know, we want to put you in so many stores and we want to do that. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's success and I'm totally mm -hmm. gassed about it. But also getting an email from a mom who says, I used your product on my daughter and for the first time she loves her hair. Mm -hmm. Having a 61 year old woman say, for all of my life I've been looking for products and I finally found something that enabled me to look in the mirror and love myself. Mm. That to me, and I'm getting tearful, but that huh. to me is success because mm. I am making the I am making the change that I want to make. Mm. And I remember not feeling beautiful. Mm. I remember not feeling like my hair was good enough. You know, there were times when I was younger where I wouldn't leave the house unless my hair was straightened or in braids mm. or covered. And being able to present to the world the conversation that changes that narrative mm. is so important to me mm -hmm. and I'm so honored mm. <laughs> I'm so honored wow. that I've been able to contribute to that wow that is just so powerful and I think as a father of two girls and two teenage girls mm. I have seen what society does yeah. to them and what society does to their hair yeah. and, and I've seen um, and the the need for them to want to gel their hair yeah. and you know all of this and I'm just like stop gelling your hair because it's breaking off and yeah. mum's always at home you know and they've got good hair yeah. but mum's always at home saying look girls stop it because you are you know you're damaging your hair Yeah. but they it's oh, very difficult for them to go into their school or college and be different yeah and like that narrative is changing now mm. because we're seeing more young girls who are you know just just happy with mm -hmm. their hair the way yeah. it is when i was in school it was almost a rite of passage mm -hmm. to have straight hair. You, know, you got to your teenage years, you started going through adolescence and maturity and you had straight hair. That was it's part of the crazy. beauty ritual. It's crazy, right? And when right? you think that this, the, the, these young girls are sitting there with this heat perm, perm on yeah. their hair, just, and they're like, oh, it's burning. It's yeah. burning. Like, that cannot be good for you. That cannot be good. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> the last time I permed my hair, I was 25, 26 years old. So it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I had the cutest little pixie cut. And I remember sitting in the hairdresser's chair and my head was on fire. Like wow. I've got a chemical on my head that she has got gloves on her hand mm -hmm. to protect her hand <laughs> from. And I've got this sitting next to my eyes, my brain, and it's absorbing in and it's burning. And I remember calling her over a few times and the last time she was like, if you want it straight, it has to burn. Wow. And for me, it was the most profound thing any hairdresser could have said to me wow. at that time because I was like, yeah, you are literally sitting under mm -hmm. this chemical. You are literally 
having chemical burns right now mm -hmm. just so you can have straight hair, just so you can feel beautiful because that's what society has told you beauty is. And that was the last time I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. Wow. I'm not doing it. So when I had my daughter, it was important that she didn't have to unlearn that because mm -hmm. I had to go through a process of unlearning mm -hmm. what was innately beautiful for mm -hmm. me and relearning mm -hmm. something else. And I didn't want my daughter to have to go through that process. I just wanted her to know from her earliest memory mm -hmm. that I, my hair, my skin, my African features, everything about me is beautiful. Yes, yes you know? Nyla, yes. So. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, it's a, and you, you know, I, I think perm is actually problematic and I think it should be cancelled. We're cancelling yeah. everything else these days and everybody else. Perm is a, a, a product that I think should be just banned and taken off the shelves. I agree because especially now there are other healthier ways mm. of um, changing your hair in order to kind of fit whatever style you want for the day. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I say again, Beauty is versatile and it is diverse. Mm. So there is nothing wrong with switching it up. I switch it up, right? Nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that at all. But just know that whether straight or whether curly, mm -hmm. still beautiful. Mm. Mm. Just know that. Mm. You know? So, goodness me, this has been a refreshing podcast. <laughs> um, so, uh, we, we spoke a lot about kind of business and your business journey and yeah. um, access to finance and, and some of your challenges and how you overcame them, which I, I think is brilliant. And also, um, you know, a, a deep dive into the Dragon's Den experience. Yeah. And I think that's always good because I think people need to kind of understand where they can access finance from and yeah. how they can access finance from and the type of challenges and barriers that that might present. Um, but I want to speak a little bit about you <laughs> um so what what you know who is cam behind the entrepreneur and you know what was your childhood like growing up and um and you know and and has that helped how's you that how's that shaped you and so forth um so childhood Obviously, I think I mentioned before, we, we grew up in the mm -hmm. same area, yes. which was, yeah, in the city. <laughs> um, I was going to shout out the, never mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <actually>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> Goodness me. Um, and being raised in that type of environment, you know the challenges that mm. we experience, right? There's economic challenges, there's social challenges, there's a lot of... Um, dysfunction there's a lot of things that you see that you shouldn't see there's a lot of things that you experience and you hear that you shouldn't hear um, the first time I was exposed to um, gang violence I'm, I'm not going to shy away from mm -hmm. it because that's my upbringing um, one of the you know someone who I'd grown up with uh, I was 15 years old and I found out that he was shot and killed right uh -huh. and these are the kind of traumas that became routine no. and normal mm -hmm. that shouldn't mm -hmm. become normal mm -hmm. right? yeah. it shouldn't be normal for you to speak to your friend one minute and an hour later mm -hmm. you find out that they've been shot and killed mm -hmm. it shouldn't be normal for you to you know hear hear bullets mm -hmm. and, and and hear of gang violence mm -hmm. like but unfortunately, um, because of th that time, which was like late 90s, early 2000s, that was one of the things that we experienced in that area. Lucky for me, my mum was very strict, mm -hmm. right? My mum <laughs> was like a hardcore strict. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mummy. So, yes, mum. mummy. <laughs> so there was a lot of socialising mm -hmm. that I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my mum used to do things like make me sit down with a book on my head because mm -hmm. she wanted me to have a certain amount of poise. She wouldn't allow me to use um, street and slang terminology mm -hmm. in the home because she wanted to make sure that I communicated in a different way mm -hmm. to what the environment that I was in, in which they were communicating. Um, so I was excluded mm -hmm. as well. 
um, from those friendship circles. So it's mm-hmm. like my mom would prevent me, but then also because of that difference, mm-hmm. I was excluded from wow. those groups of girls. Um, and it was really challenging because at, at, there was a time in my life where I felt really isolated um, and I didn't embrace my difference. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I got older, I started to realize the benefits of everything that my mom mm-hmm. had, you know, I'm, all that I'm work. I'm just seeing you <laughs> now and I'm like, yes, you know, mommy done good. She did mommy good. Done good. <laughs> she did good. Um, I am a, I am a shy person. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm starting to edge out of it slowly, mm-hmm. but you know, and naturally I'm kind of very reserved, very mm-hmm. shy. Um, I enjoy creative writing, mm-hmm. so I'm a poet as mm-hmm. well and um, write and perform poetry. So that's like, yeah, that's mm. who You're a big reader as well. I am a massive big, reader. Big I am reader. an avid reader. I love reading. I read at least one or two books a month. I right. love reading. Um, it's really important for me. Self-development mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur, I think, is one of the most important aspects mm-hmm. of being an entrepreneur. Um, constantly learning and growing um, and ensuring that you're not stagnant mm-hmm. is a massive component of mm-hmm. success and it's something that I believe in wholeheartedly. I love that. Yeah. And I just want to quickly touch upon, because um, uh, uh, being an entrepreneur is a 24-hour job, yeah, 365 <laughs> days a week, but you are also a mom, which is a 24-hour yeah. <laughs> job, 365 days a week. How on earth do you balance the two so uh, for example i'm i'm a full-time entrepreneur um but i know that actually yes my kids are 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 a priority and yeah um you know i know that but i also know that mom tara's at home and she's (laughs) holding it down so i don't (laughs) big up tara (laughs) big up tara so i don't have to worry about i don't have to worry what the kids are having to eat because i know that mom's going to look after it like but I'm sure that, it's you know, you have way. those, your, your experiences ain't the same yeah. as a mom um, and as that natural nurturer. Yeah. Um, so how do you how do manage? Um, well, from both my partner and I are entrepreneurs. So, wow. yeah, <laughs> my, my partner, he has a housing association. Mm-hmm. So he's very, very busy, very successful. Wow. Um, and he isn't home a lot of the time so he will leave you know early morning and he's gone sometimes till nine o'clock so I am not a single parent but I experience having to manage the home as a single parent Mm -hmm. because he's constantly away um I wake up around 5 30 Mm -hmm. on a late day um yeah <laughs> on, a, on a late day <laughs> around 5 30 sometimes i will hit the gym mm-hmm. um get in the gym while everyone's sleeping get mm-hmm. back home for about seven um start breakfast mm-hmm. get the children to school come home work until about three pick them up start my mommy shift mm-hmm. which is about cooking cleaning homework homework is so important for mm-hmm. me making sure my kids are reading and they're growing and they're developing. Mm -hmm. Um, Then bedtime about eight, by that time I'm usually exhausted. Wow, I could imagine. Um, But I try and do some emails, but Mm -hmm. I've learned don't email tired, don't (laughs) email tired. (laughs) When you're sending somebody (laughs) something that you're chatting. (laughs) Don't email tired. Um, And then I wake up and do it all again. So it is a struggle. I don't have much of a social life Mm. unfortunately Mm -hmm. at the moment but i recognize that it's one of the sacrifices that i have to make Mm -hmm. um i am learning and i'm just starting to learn that self-care is a priority Mm -hmm. i'm starting to learn that if i burn out there is no business Mm -hmm. so i'm doing things now like i'm leaving my phone downstairs i Mm -hmm. won't bring it upstairs because if i bring it upstairs i will wake up in the middle of the night and Mm -hmm. i'll check emails Mm -hmm. um so i've started to do that i um, allocate myself some time on a sunday to just unwind Mm -hmm. to do some self-care to read relax Mm -hmm. Um, but it's it's full on mm. at the moment. Mm-hmm. It's full on, but it's for a time, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. It's for a time. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so it so so. What's next 
for Cam and what, what's next for? I'm a, I'm a ideas person. Mm-hmm. I am such a creative and I've already got so many <laughs> ideas of other things that I want to do and how I'm going to grow this brand. Mm-hmm. So I am um, creating a solution focused brand. So it isn't just about products that help to moisturize hair and showcase um, the beauty of Afro hair. It's also about what are the problems that black women are experiencing with their hair and how can I use plant-based science to mm-hmm. fix and alleviate those challenges. So one of the things that I became aware of is that black women suffer with hair loss mm. at a rate of um, 50% where for the wider population, it's one in four. For black women, it's one in two. Um, and the reason why is obviously due to styling choices, uh, hormonal balances, all of that kind of jazz. I have created now a, which I'm launching soon, a hair loss um, serum, which we created in partnership with Coventry University. And wow. It's been tested with Birmingham University. And it has been scientifically proven to elongate the hair growth cycle. So it interrupts one of the leading causes mm-hmm. of alopecia and it regulates the stem cell production and hair growth cycle mm-hmm. so that we can halt hair loss and hair mm-hmm. shedding and i'm extremely excited I need it because i'm getting that. old and the business and everything <laughs> exactly. so, i need it, it. <laughs> yeah, no when it's so done. it's it's coming <laughs> soon it's in production it's coming soon we're going to do a lot of marketing around that i'm super excited about wow. it um, so that's the kind of direction that I'd we're going to start exploring as I well. I love it. I love it because it's, they're not just products. No. They're products that has a purpose. social purpose yeah. for our community. Yeah. Um, I absolutely love it. And honestly, I, I, I'm sure it's going to do amazing because you're amazing it's and the product's doing amazing. amazing. <laughs> and yeah, I'm just, yeah, Thank world you. domination. It literally yeah. is. Um, but I don't know, we can speak for hours and hours um, about this, but I, I realise that we've got things to do and businesses <laughs> to run. But before you leave, um, we do on this Creative Entrepreneur podcast, um, 10 in 10. And what 10 in 10 is, I just ask you 10 questions and okay, it's one go. or one. the other. Okay. I mean, some of the questions Exciting. you might not even be like, it's none, but you've got to choose one. Okay. So you have to reflect when you was younger or wh- whatever it is. But let me find where Okay. it is. For the listeners, I'm just <laughs> turning over the page to find the right paper. So, Cam, yes, you ready? True, I'm ready. Good. Um, so, Nike or Adidas? Nike. Beyonce or Rihanna? <sighs> Rihanna. <laughs> I can't. I just can't. Okay, let me just go. She's got this an up. edge that I like. Mm-hmm. She's got an edge that I mm-hmm. like. Bad girl, really. Mm-hmm. really. Queen B, you're still my queen. <laughs> Aldi or BMW? Aldi. Rush Hour or Bad Boys? Bad Boys. KFC or McDonald's? You've got to choose one. I don't want to. You've got to choose one. one. <laughs> um, McDonald's. ASOS or Boohoo? ASOS. Tupac or Biggie? Oh. <laughs> Biggie. Biggie. Because his lyrical flow was incredible mm. <laughs> j cole or kendrick lamar oh oh j cole facebook or instagram facebook podcast or books books and the last one the bonus just from the conversation that i had earlier brandy or monica <sighs> brandy Yes. <laughs> Cam, thank they you. <laughs> thank you so, so, so much, honestly. Um, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, True. Thanks for inviting me. I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs>